this time on Psychic Investigators. In the icy waters hey, off the away. coast of Maine, a lobster boat disappears. A wall of water that you can't see over. Its captain is lost in the waves. The ocean's full of creatures that are carnivores. A massive air and sea search can't find him. It's a needle in a haystack. But a New York City psychic says she knows where he is. It's an island. He's to the left of that. Laughed my butt off. And she knows exactly when he'll be found. He would be found within two days. I know I'm right. Kittery, Maine, an hour's drive up the Atlantic coast from Boston. One of the oldest settlements in America, Kittery has always been a fishing town. It's a community united in its love of the sea and its respect for the dangers of fishing life. Mother's Day, May 11, 2008. Chris Toby, a fifth generation fisherman, readies his lobster boat, the Save a Buck. With him are his 16 year old son, Christopher, and 21 year old deckhand, Robert Blackburn. This time, Chris's dog, Black, is left behind as he makes the 10-mile trip to Duck Island, where the Tobies set their lobster traps. Although the sea was rough and the wind was picking up, it was just another normal day for the fishermen. The following morning, Chris Toby's daughter realizes her father and brother are not home. Maybe they docked somewhere else for the night. She radios them. No answer. Something is wrong. No communication, no phone calls, no radio calls. That's a huge red flag. That's an immediate response. Something is desperately wrong. John Bennett is a retired deputy chief of the Maine Marine Patrol. When there's no mayday, it becomes a worst case scenario. Someone's in the water and they're struggling for their life. The Coast Guard sends out a rescue boat and a helicopter to look for the three missing men. Their mission is search and rescue. They are out to save people's lives. At this time of year, the Atlantic waters are frigid. Hypothermia is a real danger. You have a very short time to get saved. It's very difficult to find someone on the coast of Maine because of the tide, the currents, the weather conditions. The success rate is not very high. Along the coast, word spreads of the missing fishermen. Everybody knows everybody else, so there's so much community. Karen Danderant covers the story for the Portsmouth Herald. It's a fishing village, but we're still going to get in trouble. But everyone kind of rallies together. I rallies around the family, because it's one of their own. Guy might be your worst enemy yesterday, and today he's in trouble, and you're rushing out there to help him. Dozens of local fishermen join in the search. The three men have been missing for over 12 hours, but they could still be alive. With the threat of hypothermia, every minute counts. The Coast Guard estimated safely be in the water for two to three hours. For almost two hours, the Coast Guard searches the waters in the Isle of Shoals off Kittery. Mid-morning, a local fisherman spots a plume of smoke over Duck Island, 10 miles out from Kittery, where the Tobies had set their traps. My cousin called me and said they found everybody. Oh, God. Yeah, cool. Mike Waldron is one of Chris Toby's best friends. And then I got the other reports. They had two out of the three. So immediately, my heart sunk. Safe but suffering from hypothermia, deckhand Robbie Blackburn and young Christopher are brought to shore by the Coast Guard. But where is Captain Chris Toby? My grandson and, and another boy were picked up off the island and they were at Portsmouth Hospital. Thornton Toby is Chris Toby's father. I saw my grandson who was beat up from the, from the incident, but uh, nonetheless okay, uh, sort of in a state of shock. I asked him what happened and he told me the story. Sitting there all looking forward, you know, we weren't looking behind us. I hear rogue wave and turn around, there's you know, a wall of water that you can't see over. 
just a freak wave, really. Picked up the stern, you know, it kind of went like that. I didn't know where the hell I was. No life jacket, no survival suit, 10 foot waves and 55 degree water. It's a life or death situation. The waves are going in, but the current was pulling me out. And I just flew away from the boat. My dad you know, kind of saw me floating away and thought he could save me, you know, came after me. We were with each other and we were trying to swim back towards the boat, but too much current, just too much waves, you know, you just couldn't do it. His father was gone. You hear stories of a couple people swimming to shore, they're talking to each other. They're looking at each other, and then one of them just disappears. No sign of struggle, just to go down. All Chris Toby can do now is save himself. The current kind of whips around, caught me, and started bringing me back in. And it brought him to Duck Island, where deckhand Robbie Blackburn had managed to swim ashore. You know, I was with my old man all the way till the end. Chris Toby would give you the shirt off his back. He was very generous. He just wanted to be a fisherman, and boats were, were his whole life, from the time he was a little, uh, a little boy. Couldn't keep him off the water. How could he be gone? I just, you know, he was always trying to help someone, you know, get going or someone start a business or, you know, someone just catch up in life. The Coast Guard continues to look for the missing fishermen. They wouldn't have call it off immediately. You would continue in a good faith effort for a while. For the next several hours, they cover 270 square miles of the Atlantic and make more than a dozen sweeps. Nothing. The Coast Guard calls off the search. It changes from a search and rescue to a recovery. You're now looking for a body. Everyone was just desperate to bring him home. When the story appears in the paper the next day, Portsmouth resident Joseph Churchwell thinks of his sister in New York City. My brother said there was a drowning. A lobster man had drowned in the waters of Maine. Helen churchwell Lagotti is a psychic who has a personal interest in finding the lost at sea. Her father died in World War II. My father was killed at sea. I didn't search for him, but I can search for somebody else. Helen uses what she calls her sixth sense. This is like a premonition immediately, but it reacts in the solar plexus. It's a quickening, and that gives you your answer. So I never doubt when I get this quickening. I never doubt when it flashes in my mind. I know I'm right. And I said, well, give me his name. And he said, Christopher Toby. Told me about his son and his friend. I just read his name. I touch his name. I knew where Christopher Toby was. A lobster boat capsizes in high seas off Kittery, Maine. Two crewmen are rescued, but the captain is lost. A New York psychic claims she can see the location of the missing lobsterman. Helen Ligotti uses what she calls her sixth sense to find the lost at sea. It's how she located her own grandson who drowned in 2001. The Coast Guard came, brought nautical maps, put them on the table. I looked at the maps, pointed to the spot, and said, he's right there. The police at this time in New York, most of the time, the authorities do not accept information from a psychic. They dropped it. Mark came out 42 days later in here, the spot I said he was in. The psychic asks her brother to put her in touch with the woman who wrote the newspaper article about the missing man. She called me, introduced herself, told me she was a psychic. I'm a news reporter. I'm like, <laughs> sure. <laughs> she said, I can help find him. So I let her describe it to me. And I kept picking up a diamond. I mean, how do you say a diamond's in the middle of the water? I thought I was nutty. And I said, why would a diamond be there? And then a letter R kept flashing in my mind. Christopher Toby is near the diamond. 
I do see foliage, I see trees, and I see land. It really didn't mean a lot to me. It sort of sounded to me like the Isles of Shoals, but I don't know enough about them to call up Marine Patrol and go, this is where she thinks he might be. I told her I'd pass the information on. I called Maine Marine Patrol and talked to Sergeant Rick Laflame, gave him the information, and he said, well, I'll give her a call. I think at that point they were willing to try anything. I doubt that they believed should be accurate. May 14th, Christopher Toby has been lost at sea for three days. When someone drowns and they swallow water, they get negative buoyant. They go straight down and they stay there. You have a short amount of time to recover somebody before the damage to the body is so great it disintegrates. The ocean's full of creatures that are carnivores, and they attack pretty quickly. Depending on the water temperature, how big he was, he could have started to float a little bit. That means Christopher Toby could be pulled out to sea and lost forever. There's been a lot of people that have drowned and never recovered. The same day, Sergeant Rick Laflamme of the Marine Patrol gives the psychic a call. He said to me, tell me what you see or feel. I concentrate on a map. I will concentrate on the particular area. I will concentrate on a landmark, the person. I constantly saw a star. That's when he explained there was a star island. He called that one into me. I said, I keep feeling a diamond. Somehow another R is connected there. So he said, I know what you're talking about. Looking at the nautical maps, Sergeant Laflamme knows the diamond is an icon for a type of buoy called a red nun. Around the Isle of Shoals, there are only two red nun buoys. Which one is it? I kept smelling apples. And he told me on the phone, it was Apple Door. There's an Apple Door Island. One of the red nun buoys is just off the coast of Appledore Island. The patrol sergeant wants to know if the psychic can zero in even further. She turns to a divination tool taught to her by her grandmother. T makes forms for me. What I did was concentrate on the location of this particular person. And I say, wait a minute, we got an end. That meant I was picking up on north. North, it has to be north kept feeling foliage. Once I started to see foliage, I knew there had to be land there. I sketch what I see. This is a crude sketch. I take it and I match it to the map, and I pinpoint the spot. To the left of that land. The psychic told Sergeant Laflemme where she felt the body was. I have it, Helen. I know where you're staying. He marked it on a chart. An area northwest of Duck Island where the divers have already searched. Marine Patrol shares the information with the local search teams. Every available boat is out there helping. You know, the guy all your life, you know, he's in the water there somewhere. Everybody's wondering if he's dead alive, did he swim to Bermuda? You know, there's no closure, you, you know, without everybody looking at a body. They're never gonna stop wondering what happened to him if they don't actually physically get to bury a body. They want him home, even if it's to bury him. Black Dog Divers had a team down. There were a couple of independent divers that went, uh, that knew Chris. Uh, the Maine Marine Patrol sent a lot of divers. I mean, it may have been 10 divers. The divers try to search the murky waters around Duck Island. By afternoon, the foul weather returns. The seas were high, the water's cold. There were storms coming in. They had to think of the safety of their crews, too. And that's why the Marine Patrol would have called off the search, because it's just too darn dangerous. It doesn't make any sense to risk somebody else to recover a body at that time. Then, a piece of wreckage from the save buck washes ashore 25 miles away from the search area. Have they been searching in the wrong place all along? Could have drifted that far. Odds weren't very good. Eventually, all bodies will float, so. The psychic said he would be found around Duck Island. 
and she had told the Marine Patrol Sergeant when Toby's body would be found. Kept getting a chew. He would be found within two days. That means tomorrow. Kittery, Maine. Strong winds and rough waters have delayed the search for a lobsterman, now missing five days. A psychic says he'll be found today. Friday morning, May 16th. The sky is finally clear, but the Marine Patrol decides to discontinue the search. Once it goes from a search to recovery, there's only so many hours and there's only so much money set aside for the state divers and everybody to search. So there always has to be a cutoff. For state resources, that was the time allotted. Then Mike and I said, well, we can continue the search on our own effort. Jeff Campbell is a commercial diver and a good friend of the missing lobsterman. I'm not Superman. I wasn't coming in to save the day. Jeff Campbell and Mike Waldron head out to search for their friend. I guess we're kind of like the Marines. We don't want to leave anybody behind. I couldn't sleep at night knowing that I didn't try 120% to, to bring a fellow fisherman home. Maine Marine Patrol Sergeant Rick Laflamme has let everyone know about the psychic's vision of where to find the missing lobsterman, an area off Duck Island, northwest from where the boat went down. Psychic visions are nothing new to Mike Waldron. His brother helped to find another missing lobsterman, Dennis Hamill, Mike's best friend, who drowned in similar waters four years earlier. My brother's abilities are quite astounding. Certain predictions of his that would just raise the hair on the back of your neck. I'm a pretty insightful person. I'm blessed with a few gifts myself. That's probably why Rick was so receptive to the idea of this lady calling him out of the blue to tell him whether it was a body. Because he already knew. He said, wait a second, Mike's already done this once with the psychic help. Why not? Waldron, Campbell, and Waldron's wife, Wendy, head out to the area off Duck Island where the psychic, 400 miles away in New York, said the body would be found. Before we even jumped in the water, we decided we were going to go deeper than the recovery teams and the commercial divers had already searched. If the psychic is right, it will be a deep and dangerous dive. We figured Chris was going to be in 60 to 110 feet of water, but we're going to start at 60 feet of water. At noon, they drop anchor on the northwest corner of Duck Island. With the deep water was limited time, because at those depths, you aren't going to get back in the water and do another dive. You have to take into consideration bottom time. At 60 feet, you have 60 minutes, generally speaking. So at 80 feet, the divers don't have a lot of bottom time. It's, it's a quick little down and back, really. We do a towing procedure, but you're constantly moving. That way, you're covering the most ground that you can. We went from that corner north along the north face of Duck Island, but out beyond the limits of the other recovery divers. It seems like you're diving in a washing machine. The seas can be moving in several directions. Uh, it's not just like one continuous wave pool. You know, it's, you can be pushed in different directions simultaneously, practically. into the dive, Campbell sees something. You know, I'm looking down like this. Chris was off to my right, about 20 feet down in the crevice, laying face down, straight out, arms at his side. And he was on the borderline of my depth, being able to see down to my right. First dive, less than a half a tank, and he was right there. You never know. It's a needle in a haystack. We were just fortunate enough to thread the needle. I can remember it like yesterday. <sighs> Chris Toby's body is found 100 yards from where psychic Helen Lagotti said it would be found, and on the day she predicted. Oh my God, that's what she said. Well, when you have a brother like mine, you're used to it, so it didn't surprise me in the least bit. They can do amazing things if 
you believe. I think when you imagine the enormity of the ocean and all the variables that can happen when someone drowns, just to be able to find that person, it's a big, big deal. It really is. To be found in that short a time, it was a really, really long shot. They bring the body of Chris Toby to the Coast Guard station. The search has ended. I got my car and I did about 50 miles an hour to the Coast Guard station. A relief in one way, but made me upset again in another way. I was just happy that they had found him. But um, you're never going to get over this. Just, it, it, it just leaves a big hole. You never get over it. One of the authorities called me to tell me he's been found. He said, Helen, you were right. You have no idea how close you are. He was found within the two-day period, and we got him home. Sergeant Laflemme admitted to me that Christopher Toby was found pretty much where she said he would be. The divers found the body within 100 yards of where she marked it on the chart, which in my opinion is remarkable. 100 yards on the ocean is minuscule. It's kind of a miracle. I mean, she just found him. And she had never even been to the Isles of Shoals. I had to explain to her what they were. Kind of in awe, being a skeptical reporter. I didn't find it unusual or it didn't bother me any. I've used psychics before. I would use any means to make a recovery. It can't hurt. The save -a is recovered and examined. The vessel's automated emergency beacon failed to transmit the boat's distress. As a result, the search was delayed for 15 hours. Chris Toby never stood a chance. Well, the save -a he really liked. It was a state-of-the-art boat, three times as fast as anybody. You always knew when Chris was upset, though, because there's a little extra water flying off, or he'd have it wound right up. That was a nice boat. And Chris knows what he's doing when he's building the boats. Thornton Toby is grateful to Mike Waldron and Jeff Campbell for making the dangerous dive. It was just above and beyond. I think he must have had a lot of uh, um, feelings for my son, or he wouldn't have put himself in that danger. I'm, I'm really happy that they, you know, found found him. You know, I still do all the same things. Nothing's changed that much except for that my dad's not here, you know? I hate it. I hate it. I think he's trying to do what he thought his father would want him to do, and I think that's been a comfort to him. After it first happened, I, I felt like I never, ever wanted to go back out there again. But I went out there, we hauled up my traps, and once I got through them the first time, I, I felt OK again, you know? It made me feel a little bit more like myself again. Black still goes down to the docks every day, waiting for his master to come home. <laughs>